Thank you for that introduction. So my uh, BC, I don't think we talked about that. My, uh, I just got certified uh, in uh, nursing professional development as well. So just finished that one up. This is going to be very low key, OK? So um, I have some data to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you kind of how we set up this project that we did. This, by the way, was my capstone for my uh, DMP. Uh, so this is a, a much easier audience to present to than the last time I presented this. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, so we're going to talk about unplanned extubations, um, competency, and the use of simulation to evaluate that is what we're going to talk about just a little bit today. So uh, I, I'm an educator, so there will be a test at the end. <laughs> and this is the question that I will, and I'm going to give it to you ahead of time. So that when we're over with you guys on the back row, better have the answer for me, okay? <laughs> so is one acceptable? That's my question. Is one acceptable? So a little history on this. Uh, Shannon's back there. Shannon Shuttlesworth uh, and I have worked on unplanned extubations for how many years now, Shannon? Five, six years? We originally did a master's capstone with Shannon on unplanned extubations in the PICU. And uh, I just decided to try to take that one step further for my capstone as well. So we've kind of been back and forth with this for quite a while. So this was the question and the statement that really kept me going with this. You know, this should be our ultimate goal. Anytime we're taking care of patients, we should improve their health and the quality of the life, right? Do you, you guys agree with that? Is that? That's what we ought to be about, right? Unplanked ext extubations don't play into that at all. So this is what kind of drove me through all of this um, as we got to going. So unplanned extubations are a problem in every ICU. Any, you guys, critical care nurses, any? No? Unplanned extubations are a problem? Unplanned extubations are a problem in adult ICUs, surgical ICUs, medical ICUs, pediatric, <coughs> neonatal, you name it, they all have problems with unplanned extubations. My take on this was, can we do some education with simulation to improve that rate? And that's kind of where we went with all of this. So um, we know by the literature, and I'll show you some of these studies here in just a minute, that we can improve things with simulation. So, did I move, miss a slide? No, okay. So, unplanned extubations, I have to explain a little bit here. The numbers that you're going to see are based on 100 <coughs> ventilator days. And it's only because that, that's a national standard that we measure unplanned extubations by. So, so the numbers that you're going to see up here, you're going to go, well, what in the world is 0.11? unplanned extubations, it's per 100 ventilator days. So that's the common denominator that we use across the nation to, to, to look at unplanned extubations. And so the range that I found in the literature was from 0 0.11 to 2.7 per 100 ventilator days. So just kind of remember that number. The other thing that I found when I looked at the literature was there are some problems that come along with that as well. We increase the length of stay. You guys that work in the hospital, what do we, what do we worry about the most? Discharge days, we gotta get them out of the hospital. So if we're doing this, we're increasing the length of stay. So that's a problem. It increases morbidity and mortality as well. Um, I'll tell you the mortality piece of that is more towards the NICU area. We don't have a lot of mortalities from unplanned extubations in adults. So. Those are the things that I found. So this is a national, international problem. Uh, and it does not respect age as well. So it's a local problem as well. So I'm going to share some numbers from our PICU, just so that you know kind of where we're at. So uh, PICU had historic rates that ranged from uh, 0 to 5.8. So remember that number I gave you a minute ago? What was it, 0.11 to 2? we kind of get high sometimes in our PICU as far as um, national ranges go. So the other thing that I want you to see when we looked at the literature and 
we looked at our numbers, and this will make sense to you guys that work pediatrics. The highest rates are in the winter months. So we know about RSV, we know about all of the pneumonias. Those all happen in that frame of the winter months for PICU. So those were our high numbers from November to March. So this worked out great for me because this, the timing of this worked out just fine so that we did our intervention and then measured during the highest peak time. So that was a good thing for us. The most recent study that I found of these numbers, I, I uh, really want to talk to this author because I want to know how he got his numbers. Because I, I did a cost analysis on others and I had a challenge. So <laughs> anyway, this, this study by uh, Roddy increases of six and a half days on average for an unplanned extubation. That's a big number in, in an ICU. You're keeping somebody that much longer. Hospital costs, they estimated at over 36,000 per event. So a lot of money involved in that as well. Increased morbidity and mortality. We've already talked about that just a little bit. And despite everything that we've done about this and that we know about it, we continue to have high rates. So our aim was to uh, look at the transfer of knowledge. And those of you guys that are in education settings right now, that's what we look for, right? Can they take the book knowledge and take it to the bedside? And so that's what I wanted to look at. Can we take uh, that knowledge and train our staff using simulation and make that transfer to the bedside and decrease our rates? So this was my big research question. I, you're going to ask me why did I pick five months, and I'll tell you why I picked five months. <laughs> because I had to finish this study before I could graduate. <laughs> and, and so I stopped my data collection at five months so I could turn my paper room. So that was, that was why I chose five months. <laughs> Nothing scientific about it. But. All right. so. Um, Literature synthesis. So what, what are the reasons why we have unplanned extubations? We were looking at this. Why is this a problem? So we looked at um, some local issues. This is what came from the literature. The ones that I have uh, uh, highlighted and underlined are the ones that we felt like we could maybe impact with, with this uh, simulation education piece. So um, inadequate sedation was something I didn't want to tackle. Uh, because that becomes very interprofessional with the physicians and who writes what and how they do their protocols and do you have a protocol, do you not. Lots of variables there that I did not want to get into. So agitation again goes back to the sedation piece of that. The ones that we felt like we could look at were uh, manipulation of the endotracheal tube. So if we're in the ICU, what do we have to do with these patients every two hours? Turn them, right? So what are we doing every time we turn those patients? We're manipulating that too. So that's one we thought we could look at. Uh, I threw BMI in there because I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, we didn't look at BMI, so. Uh, ina inadequate secured ET tubes. Shannon, I'm gonna, because you've got a little history on this. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that we found was the number of ways that you guys were taping tubes, right? And the problem with that is if you've got to retape a tube and you don't know how it was taped before, you don't know how to undo the tape, right? So how do I do that safely? So that was one of the things as a historic thing that we looked at, or we, these guys looked at, they did most of the work on this. So we looked at how we were taping and how could we come to a consensus on one taping method. And that was, that was one of our biggest things we did before we ever got started with all of this. So something to think about. And then manipulation of the patient as well. That ET tube and that patient, anytime we move them, that ET tube is moving as well. So those are the things we felt like in this PICU we thought we could uh, uh, address those issues and hopefully do something about those. These are the ways in the literature that I found that uh, people have tried to address the issue. They've looked at weaning protocols. Again, we didn't choose to go there. Risk factor reduction is what some of the things that we wanted to look at. 
And then I found two studies, uh, both of them by Rockman. Uh, you guys that do quality improvement or have done any looking at that, how many QI projects have you seen that had a follow-up study? I had never seen one either. This is the only QI study I've ever seen that had a follow-up study. So they did their intervention in 2009. They came back in 2014, 13, to evaluate it again. Did we sustain our QI project? One of the few I ever saw. So if you, this is, will be available. Great articles to read. Yes, ma'am. You have a question? If you have a question, stop me because that's what we're here for is to, to learn. <coughs> Um, but anyway, that, that was a very interesting uh, article to me, and those two articles really are what drove what I tried to do with our simulation. So, why simulation? Well, I like simulation. <laughs> That's why. No. no, the literature says that uh, simulation can improve outcomes. It's been proven in the literature. Um, the bar study there is probably one of the landmarks if you're looking at uh, simulation and improving patient outcomes I would suggest you look at that article they took uh, residents in a critical care rotation and they took half of the group and they did simulated central line placement the other half of the group they did traditional see one do one teach one and they had a statistically significant better outcome with the group that did simulation training. So the Orman study was on nurses, and this one kind of hits better to home as far as I'm concerned. They looked at CPR, and could we with simulation either maintain or improve CPR skills? So in this study, they were measuring depth of, of compressions. How many of you guys, when you check off on CPR, get checked off on the depth of your compressions? Did they check you? <coughs> the light. And that's what they used in this study was, how do we get depth of compression consistent? Because we all know if we're not compressing deep enough, we're not sending the blow where it needs to go. So what they did with this study, and I'll ask a question, this is another test question for you. How many, uh, so what they did with this group, they took a group, and they checked them off with their annual CPR. Took a second group, did annual CPR. This first group, they took them and they practiced once a month CPR with the mannequins that gave them audible and visual feedback. How long do you think they studied or practiced every month? Oh, by the way, this group maintained or improved their depth of compression over that year. These guys, what do you think happened with them? Their skills degraded. So how long did you think they had to practice monthly to have that improvement? In depth of, in depth of compression, by the way, that's what impressed me about this. And you get, yeah, come on, this is uh, interactive. <laughs> Two hours. Two <coughs> hours. Anybody else? 15 minutes. 15, five minutes a day. Five minutes once a month. And they maintained or improved their depth of compression in CPR. Uh, five minutes. Dude, we can do that. You know? So anyway, simulation can improve our outcomes. So as we started this study, we had some ethical considerations that we needed to look at. Um, privacy is always an issue. Uh, we'll talk about how I address these here in just a minute. Uh, risk to respect. Can I open that up? What do you guys think that would be for, as an ethical issue? Whose respect? The providers. The providers. We don't think about that very much, do we? We think about our patients, right? Do we think about the, the risk to the respect of that staff member that we're studying? We think about that? So here's what came up with me and my capstone advisor on this was, what are you going to do to that staff member that fails the competency exam? Are you going to let them continue to practice on patients when you know now they aren't competent to do this? What do you do about that? 
More training. More training. So we looked at that, and I never had thought of that before, but I, I want to bring that up because if you're doing QI, you really need to think about the staff that you're interacting with, particularly if you're looking at competencies. So I just bring that up as an oh, by the way. So what do you think we did about that? Suggestions on what we should have done to, to correct our staff? More practice. Boy, you all are really quiet. Come on, guys. Just throw something out there. What if you were the staff nurse and I was checking you off on um, uh, securing an ET tube and you didn't do well, what would you want me to do for you? Offer remediation. Remediation. Exactly. Or would you rather me fire you on the spot? <laughs> you, see, you see where I'm going with that? At some point, what if that staff member never reaches competency level? What do I do with them? So here's how we address that. You get three chances. After three chances, I turf it to the nurse manager. You do what you want to with it. So that's what we did. Uh, luckily, we didn't have anybody that failed after the first. And I'm going to I'll give you my perceptions of why that happened uh, a little bit later. I didn't have any conflicts of interest and protection from harm wasn't for necessarily our patients as much as it was for the staff that we were training and evaluating. So some things to think about from my perspective that I really hadn't thought about in a QI project is that we need to really protect the staff that we're evaluating with that, not necessarily the patients because with simulation, we're bringing that out of the bedside, so I don't have to worry about that. So these are the ways that we address those uh, ethical issues. Uh, we use simulation, so we weren't at the bedside, so we didn't worry about the patients. Uh, and then we gave the staff three attempts to complete the evaluation project. Randall, can, can I ask, can you go back to that slide just one second? Sure. Because um, the fellow and I were just having this conversation about about when do you go to IRB? <laughs> and some of you might wonder that. Like, this is a challenge. It is because and this I don't is know that most places have project. really addressed that yet. So talk to most, us about that. So, so what do you guys know about in, institutional review boards? What do you know about them? Avoid them at all costs, it's right? <laughs> <laughs> you guys have had to deal with that yet? Probably not at the bachelor's level. Any master's students? You guys having to deal with that? So, so <laughs> what about I? Who who do you go to IRB or what do you go to the IRB with? I'm just now finding out about IRB altogether. So, what are you going to them with? Is uh, it a research study? Research, yeah. That's what IRBs were designed for. It was research studies where we are taking subjects and we are subjecting them to our research question, and it's for the protection of that <laughs> patient. That's what the IRB is for. You all talked about in your nursing history about Tuskegee. They didn't do an IRB on that, I'll tell you. So, so that's the whole idea behind IRB. It's the protection of that participant in your study. The problem is QI is kind of in a gray area. I'm not really researching patients necessarily. I'm looking at a process. I'm trying to improve a process. Does that need to go to a research review board or not? And I, that's kind of what we battle right now is, does it go to IRB or do we develop a true uh, QI committee that looks at our QI process? I don't think we're there yet, but I, it's, I think we're trying to address that at Covenant a little bit, but it's a gray area with QI. So I sent mine anyway, so it wouldn't be a gray area. And they said, oh, this is a QI study. Why is it here? And said, go do your thing. So but with that being said, Randall, sometimes you start with QI and it morphs into research. Exactly. Or the other way around. So Correct. Research morphs into QI. So Correct. It's when, you, it's when you catch yourself in that real exactly. gray area, of tr that transitional period. So when in doubt, go to IRB. That's a, that's a, that's <laughs> a great rule of thumb. And two, if you're planning on uh, getting it published, you've got Certainly. to Certainly. Yeah, you account. need to jump through that hoop yeah. to make sure you got all your... Are you planning on this being a publisher? Uh, I'm doing my last edits. I'm planning on submitting um, probably next week. Mm -hmm. So that was the, in the beginning, that's what you planned? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. That was a requirement and, and of graduation for us. The, the, <laughs> 
the deal with this, and, and I, I came up with a, a subject that I was already familiar with, so, and I would tell you if you're doing QI, that's probably where you want to be, is with something that you're familiar with. So I had a little history there, and I, I honestly think we could probably publish yours, but that's your job, not mine. <laughs> but, um, no, I, I th this, this information um, goes both to QI process uh, improvement and it also goes to uh, simulation education, I think. So I've got two audiences that I think would benefit from the information. So, Okay. So I have my theoretical background here. Um, so I chose uh, Carrie Lindbergh's uh, COPA model. Y'all familiar with Lindbergh at all? No? Y'all should look at this. This is really cool because um, I think you're going to see more of her model popping up in the next few years. Um, and we're loosely based in some things right now. I don't think they're calling it the COPA model, but it's the COPA model. So. Anyway, I chose this one, and here are the reasons why. The first one is I'm familiar with the model. So <laughs> that was a good one for me. But um, it provides a framework so that we can delineate some specific practice outcomes. And this is competency-based, performance-based is the model. And so what we were going to do is educate our staff, and then we were going to take them and have them exhibit those performance skills to us. So this model fit just perfectly with what I wanted to do. Take some of the subjectivity out. When you set this up, you come up with the key steps to whatever the skill is. And here's the skill, and they either did it or they didn't. Yes or no. So it's, it, it takes some of that subjectivity out. You guys that have been graded on rubrics may understand what I'm talking about there. So, so here was the design. Um, we looked at an assessment. We did a safety culture assessment way, way back, try to see where we were in the unit as far as attitudes towards safety. This is a safety issue. Um, I didn't include that in any of my literature, but it was an interesting little uh, study. So we did an assessment of those competencies um, and tried to look at what were the things that we needed to look at that were most important. I did a rudimentary cost analysis, and then I used uh, IHI's uh, quality improvement design for setting this study up. So here was the plan. <coughs> The first two points up there took us probably six, eight, ten months to get through those first two steps. And where do you, what do you see? There's nothing glamorous about those two steps, are there? That's, that's sit down and grind it out. What's the policy? What are the steps to the policy? What's the procedure? How are we going to set this up? But it was the hardest part of the whole thing to get a group of people together in a room, and it was interprofessional. We had RTs there, we had RNs there, we had physicians there, everybody coming from a different viewpoint, trying to agree on what this policy was going to look like. That, <laughs> this was our biggest challenge, I will say. And Rick, can I ask you right there, how did that group use the literature to guide how they came to consensus? Because, you know, that's a really big, we spend a lot of time It's a huge now. thing looking at how much so, is that literature and, and breaking that down into two, uh, the taping procedure was a whole another ball game. The policy itself was in and of itself another exercise. I don't know how many hours you guys spent on looking at other hospitals policies. I know y'all probably went to the other Texas children's hospitals because they're a member of that group. Uh, I probably looked at Cincinnati Children's too, I'm guessing because they're one of the premiers in the nation. Um, so we looked at what other hospitals were doing. The funny thing you're going to find with most of your pediatric stuff, there's not a lot in the literature in some cases on pediatrics because we don't like to study pediatrics. Why not? Risk to that patient. <coughs> so um, they did the groundwork on that because they are the content experts, which I am not. And now I, I helped them and I had some literature things and I made some suggestions. But this is another key. 
the people who are doing the work have to have the buy-in. So they did most of that work for me. Um, which is why this thing worked is because they wanted to make a change. So that's how we got started with all of that. And it took six, eight, nine months just to get this policy um, worked to where we wanted it. And, and, and you're probably ready to revise it again now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> because see, we implemented something and, and once you implement something, you're gonna see something else and you go, oh, well, we gotta change this now. And that's QI, that's, that's what you do with QI. You, you, you implement something and you study it. What do we need to change now? So, um, and then we developed the education and training and that was really easy once we'd gone through the steps because everybody was intimate with what does this policy look like? What are the steps to the procedure for um, taping these endotracheal tubes? And then it was really easy for us to do the education piece to that. Any other questions on this slide? This was part of the training. We chose to use um, a commercially prepared endotracheal tube stabilization device. We used Hollister Neobar. <laughs> the only, and, and I will tell you that there was no reason to use those other than that's what they had in the hospital at the time. So we didn't go choose other products. Uh, so I don't think we really had a conflict of interest there. This is what they had in the hospital, so we decided to use it. The problem that we had was, remember, multiple ways to tape. Half the time they weren't using the device, sometimes they were. So we had seven or eight, or I think we got seven or eight different ways to tape the tubes. So it, it was uh, pretty amazing, actually. So what we did was, was developed these slides that were placed on the internet for the staff to look at whenever they chose. It was a reference that they could go back to whenever they wanted to. They needed to watch this before they came in for their in-person review of this. We reviewed the policy with them, and then we went through the steps of the procedure. And at that point, then, they got the chance to do the hands-on with the equipment. So, this was the do part of the cycle here. Education and training, education and training. Those are the pieces of the puzzle that I think um, <coughs> we may have could have improved those some, but I think we did a good job with what we did. So we did an initial training back in July, August. I don't remember exactly what, it was August, wasn't it? Something like that. So we did the initial training in August, and I purposely waited two months to come back and retest and do the competency testing. I wanted to see if the, if the information stuck. If I gave it to them and turned right around and, and tested them, I really wouldn't know if the information we gave them was useful or not. So August, we did the initial training. October, we did the competency ev evaluations. And luckily, we had no additional training that was needed, so that was good. So then we studied our problem. So now we've got everybody uh, has had their competency evaluation and checked the box and they're all okay to go. The next step is we gotta figure out whether we did any good or not. So we're gonna study the problem. So we looked at unplanned extubation rates on a monthly uh, basis. Uh, and here's where, you remember we were talking about per 100 ventilator days and that's so confusing. So we reported it to the staff as a raw number, so oh, we had one extubation, one unplanned extubation this month, or we had two un unplanned extubations. So they never really saw those fractionated numbers, which make no sense. So if you think about it, if you're working in that unit, what makes sense to you is that patient in the bed, right? That one patient that was an unplanned extubation. So that's what we chose to do that on purpose for the staff. And then we tracked that data on the uh, ventilator days as well, just so we could compare it with what the national averages were as well. So, um, am I bored you to death yet? So, anyway, here comes the good stuff. So then we acted. Once we pulled all that data, here's what we found. After we had done our training, we weren't perfect. We had three unplanned extubations in my study period. <coughs> Interestingly enough, two of those 
were breaches of the protocol that we had developed. One of those was due to sedation. So it really made me feel good. We know why we had some problems here, so how do we address those? So now we've got something to work on. So to me, this said, if we'd have followed procedure, does this say this to you, if we'd have followed the procedure, we'd have been at one, maybe. Here's my run chart. This is uh, September of 13 to uh, March of 16. Our initial training was in August. We did our competency evaluation here. Uh, and you'll see one, two, three dots. The green line that you see there is national averages. And the red line is the trend line for our unplanned excavation. So do you see any good things on here? What do you guys see on there that looks good to you? You all looked at run charts yet? I love run charts because they tell you what you're looking at. So, so to me, if you look at that red line, that red line looks pretty impressive to me. I like the red line because we've got it trending down. So as a unit, we're trending down. So this blue dot, that blue dot, and that blue dot are my three unplanned extubations during our evaluation period. <clears throat> and you're going, well, why is one of them higher than the other? Two, if it was just one. Remember how we measure them per 100 ventilator days. So it's going to depend on how many other ventilator days were going on here. Does that make sense at all? OK. So I really liked that. I mean, we, we went from the worst period of the year for extubations, and we dropped that number significantly from over here. So I was really happy with those numbers, even though we weren't perfect, right? So then we looked at cost analysis. This was the most challenging part to me, because I had to go talk to accountants. Um, and they talk a whole other language. <laughs> So this was a challenge for me. So what I did was is I, I looked at charges on uh, eight unplanned excavations in the previous year. And I tried to coincide what charges were made for those patients on the day of the unplanned excavation. And so those are the categories that I looked at. They're all going to get an ABG. They're all going to get a blood draw. They're all going to get all of these things. There, and I just went conservatively with one extra PICU day. Remember that first study I showed you had six and a half days? I couldn't justify that with my data. So I just said conservatively they're going to be in the ICU another day. And my number came out to $15,500 per episode. So if we took those two that were breaches of our protocol, we just saved the hospital $30,000. Does that sound good to y'all? Mm -hmm. Sounds really good to me. The cost that I didn't put up here, which, which cost do you think I didn't put up there? Labor. Hmm? Labor. Uh, labor. <laughs> Physician charges. What they're going to charge. Physician charge. I got the charge for the intubation. Yeah. The charge for the re-intubation I, I put in there. I don't know what they charge for their other services, but, and that's another hard one to get to out yeah. of this data. What about emo emotional oh, costs? Mm, mm, that's immeasurable. How do you measure emotional <laughs> costs? Yeah. If, if that's my child in the bed <laughs> and it, that child of mine extubated, how much does that emotionally cost me? That's a hard one to measure, but to me, that may be the most important cost of all. So I, I, I don't know how to figure that, but that's my number that I came up with. This was a rough cost of what it cost us to do the training. About $1,200. Is that a good return on investment? I, I think so. Pretty cheap to do education for 1200 bucks for how many nurses you guys have? 30, yeah. 30 nurses and I trained them all for $1,200? How did we do that? How did I keep this number so low? Make sure that they were in the unit 
we went in the unit. We did our training in a separate bed in the unit, mannequin in the bed. The nurses got 15 minutes or so, came over, they did their training. <coughs> so, try to be as. Our equipment, our supplies, you know, when they had us, they would go get whatever emergency needs they had instead of going in a simulation lab, which definitely has its role and purpose, but for a nurse at the bedside, doing it in their own unit just made all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. There are some psychological pluses to doing it there as well. Um, interestingly enough, uh, noise levels. Mm -hmm. Hearing other people talk adds to the realism uh, that it's hard to measure, but it increases the engagement of the nurses if you're in that, that type of environment, which is why I love where we're at, because we get the uh, overhead when they call cold blues and when they call Dr. So-and-so, I get that over my overhead, so the students get that too, so I, I like that. So, but we tried to keep our cost down. So we kind of analyzed this already. I'm gonna not go over that. So here were my recommendations just by the time and when we did our training, uh, right before peak season, I, my first recommendation is uh, to continue to monitor, obviously. This is an ongoing problem uh, and it's not gonna go away if we don't stay on top of it. Uh, we we uh, probably need to do a root cause analysis on all two breaches and I'm, I'm guessing they probably did that and understand where that issue was. Um, the questions that I have and you guys have incorporated this into your new hires, haven't you already? Are you doing this with your new hires? My thing is, if this is going to be something that's important to the unit, it needs to be incorporated in. When you get a new hire, they need that training. My question for, what do you have questions about this? Y'all have questions? Where should I go with this study? taken a look at this currently nationwide throughout children's hospitals. We're a part of the Solutions for Patient Safety, which is a collaborative amongst other children's hospitals throughout the nation, and they made unplanned excavations a hospital-acquired condition, just like a, you know, infection would be, and decided to make a bundle for it specifically, which is exactly what we did. Um, and then Amber's a, a, the educator in the PICU, and she's leading that task force for Covenant Children's and so and she said we're so far ahead of the game compared to other children's hospitals and it's Doesn't that make you feel this. good? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. We're like so, we've done that. We'll share that. We'll share that. You know, so it is exciting. It's quite into the adult population. That is exactly my point. We've got a model here <laughs> that we showed a decrease in unplanned extubations. I, clearly. My next thing is, can I reproduce that in another unit? That's the next thing I would probably say. The other question that I, y'all have any other questions that I should look at coming off of this study? Where would you go with this? I'm open to ideas because I think we could use them. They could use them on their task force. So what do you guys think? Man, y'all are a tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Using different equipment. What's that? Like you said, that you what was on your unit. Yeah. Something different. My, my question is, how often do I need to train? What's the recipe for the right amount of training to drop that down where we keep it at? Are we going to get rid of every unplanned extubation? No. That's a uh, physical impossibility, I would have to say. Because you've got so many variables with the kid. Can we get it to a manageable level? You bet. But how do we do that? We gotta keep it in the forefront of our staff. They've gotta know that this is a problem that we wanna to continue to work on. How often do we train? Do we do it twice a year? Do we do it once a quarter? To keep that number where we want it. That's the next question that I would go to in the PICU. How often do we need to train? Because we know we can drop the rate with the training. How often do we need to do it? It's the next step there. And going to another unit and see if we can't do it there. You know, Randall, as a quality improvement effort, I would say making some sort of um, transparency of the actual data in real time on PICU. So nurses, right. when they walk in that unit, know exactly where we, they we are. We tried to do that with the, 
once a month you had one. There may be better ways to do that. I, I don't know. That was my thought was, you know, let's, let's tie that unplanned extubation to the patients that we deal with rather than giving them the rates. The rates don't mean anything to anybody as far as I'm concerned, other than for me and my run charts, good for my run charts. So that's my study. Oh, it wasn't a study, it was a QI project, sorry. <laughs> it's awesome. So I go back to my statement again, and, and that's where we wanna be. I, I think we accomplished that somewhat with this mm -hmm. project. I think we hopefully improved the quality for those patients. So then my question, here's the test question again. Is one acceptable? Is one unplanned extubation acceptable? Not if it's my grandson. Not if it's mine. Right. That's exactly right. And that to me is the attitude we sometimes lose as caregivers. We get so busy with our day to day that we forget that there's a one in the bed there. There's a one in the bed. So that's my question for you. Is one acceptable? I don't think so. Will we ever get to zero? I don't know. Chase it. References are there. Here's my thank yous. Aww. This was a two year project, if you guys can believe that. Now, I, I will tell you, I got some uh, flack about doing this over a two year pr process. Why do you think that was? You guys didn't know anything about QI. What is QI? It's rapid. It's rapid improvement, right? It shouldn't take me two years to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Those are my projects. So. In reality, I don't know if we could have done this much faster as much time as we've spent on policy and procedure. I honestly don't know. The data collection piece of it was fast. It was what led up to that. So anyway, Dr. Ashcraft was my uh, uh, capstone advisor. Dr. Decker, who is my mentor, I learned everything I know about simulation from her and probably then some. Dr. Lindbergh, I spent several phone calls with her on her model and we went back and forth a few times on her. I said, well, and I guess you're the expert, so I shouldn't argue with you. <laughs> yes, Going back to the policy, what okay. do you think were barriers? Why did it take so long to push that through, make policy changes? What do you, what were the, the most? I give you my perception, and you can ask these guys back okay. here, because it's their policy. <clears throat> One of the things was, I don't think that policy had been looked at frequently enough. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think that is a challenge, as you know, mm -hmm. keeping up with policies. Yes. The other thing is, is it's hard to write policies in pediatrics when you don't have any literature to go by. True. I think that was another challenge that they had with that. The other one was we tried to incorporate as many people as we could into that policy, so we brought physicians in, RTs in, and nurses. And anytime you go interprofessional, you're going to have challenges with the viewpoints that each one of them has. That's my perception. I, you guys may want to add to that. Absolutely. I agree with all of that. We also did multiple trials throughout it and said, okay, let's try and implement this method, mm -hmm. trial it, see if it works. And then we found all kinds of gaps in it and thought that we needed to add, okay, to do a chest x-ray on an intubated kid, this is what you do to turn, this is what you do, linen change. I mean, it just became, we kept finding gaps and gaps, and then we brought in, well, what if the patient's a difficult or critical airway? That needs to be included, and then we had to look at, then respiratory had this whole slew of policies that coincided with it, yes. as you know. Yes, I know. So I think the other part was all the trials that we did, we did many, um, PDSAs throughout the entire policy And change. your difficult airway piece of that came out of trauma. Yes. From Belinda. Mm -hmm. And we they weren't even part of the thing. They just heard about what we were doing. They said, well, what about difficult it's airway? major issues with the difficult airway, not inconsistencies. And okay, so then how did you handle, did you, what about the documentation piece in Meditech? Was there a lot that had to be changed in Meditech for, for, Yes. Well, we did a few revisions. If you manipulate a tube, the order for how to manipulate a tube was real incorrect. So that was a huge gap we found and had to revise that. And then 
we had to develop what we decided instead of developing into Meditech on paper, we did a SBAR for when we had an unplanned extubation to try and figure out why. But were there any other Meditech revisions? <coughs> that was one of the that, was, the that was one of the first problems we found was is reporting of unplanned extubations was hit and miss. Yeah, we yeah. didn't have a good. So we didn't structure. really think we were getting a good handle on whether we were reporting all the unplanned extubations. Somebody thought respiratory was reporting it. Somebody thought nursing was reporting it, and some of them didn't get reported. Yeah. So that needed to be changed too. That so it needed to be extubated. You know, like what? Oh, no. yeah. yeah, they were so close to extubation. We won't count that one. So the interprofessional piece, although it's added time to the process, what positive takeaways did y'all get from working together interprofessionally versus had it just been nurse centric? From outside, for me, I thought it went very seamlessly. I, I you know, I, I wasn't there for some of the times when they were probably <laughs> arguing about things, but, <laughs> but, but, but honestly, I, I, it, I'll tell you, the, the first few meetings that we had um, were very, very quiet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, that, I think that goes back to uh, some culture, some culture issues between departments and disciplines. And we've siloed everybody for so many years well, we're respiratory, we just do our thing, and you're nursing, you just do your thing, and we're, maybe we'll meet at the bedside every once in a while, um, <clears throat> and then the, you throw the docs in there, and you know. <laughs> yeah. So I think part of the problem was, was just a culture issue. I will say that I think pediatric has a leg up on that versus the adult population. I just. I just, I think they work better as teams than the adult population does. So I think that's one of the reasons that it went so well. Thank you. It's because they, they tend to, uh, now. Or Dr. Stinnett. I'm not gonna tell you that everything was perfect or is everything now perfect? No. Uh, they're still gonna bang their heads over issues between the departments just because that's the way it is, I guess. But we need to get away from that. But we can. Dr. Sen, I want to commend you for your good work. And, Thank you. Um, we went long. Uh, no, you did a great job. And um, I, I think it's a really great example of, you know, we're all nurses in here, and we have the capacity, we need to view ourselves this way at every level to make really meaningful observations. You make meaningful observations in the workplace every day about problems. <laughs> You scratch your head and you think, is one too many? And, and we have the capacity to lead the change. And I would know, suggest one other thing. It doesn't have to be a big patient care thing. If you've got something that is just bugging you to death at work that makes you have to work harder or work around, that's something you need to fix to make your work go better. And you can do that at the bedside. You guys can do that. Just say I want to take care of this problem let's go work on it and you can do that this this is not really rocket science we we've kind of elevated it a little bit but you guys do trial and error all the time let's just do it scientifically so that we can track what we do so we don't go back and repeat the same problems over again but you guys can do QI tomorrow if you want to you do Q QI at home. You do it all the time, don't you? Wow. You, you don't keep opening a, a, a cabinet and banging it on your thumb when you close it, do you? You figure out how to fix that problem, right? We do QI all the time. Why don't we do it in our work area? We do it in our lives all the time. So it's not something we're unfamiliar with. It's just some of the terminology may be a little bit different. But QI is something everybody can do. Which is why I like it. <laughs> That's why I like it. Okay, any other questions? Thank you.